Hi everyone, welcome to PA Talks. In this episode, we have Linka Dubildum in our studio. She's the co-founder of Architectonics, a widely recognized practice for its award-winning projects and for their use of smart building systems and innovative structures. Winka is the chair of Weitzman Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of Strange Objects, New Solid and Massive Things book that was published in 2021. She also serves as the external examiner for the Bartlett UCLL in London and is one of the creative directors of CityX exhibit in the virtual Italian pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Before we dive into the episode, let's highlight Picademy, an architectural educational platform dedicated to parametric design and computational tools in architecture. In collaboration with top architects and designers, we have covered a vast array of topics in this domain. Join our live workshops and explore the cutting edge intersection of design, technology, and architecture. Now let's get into the conversation. Okay, thank you so much, Minka, for joining uh, our office for this uh, show, PA Talks. You know, we have hosted more than uh, 50 amazing guests in our PA Talks episodes, and it's really great to have you in the show. Uh, we've been following your work for so many years, and uh, the last time we, we met actually was around 2019, probably in Istanbul again. And uh, uh, in that time, we were just uh, starting the, uh, the, the shows and episodes. But uh, this time you're here in our own office. So, so, so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, no, so great to be here. Thank you for inviting me and uh, congrats on your new office. Um, it's always great to be back in Istanbul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So you were flying to Istanbul from London, uh, a couple of projects there probably. And then in Istanbul, you're going to visit some sites in Cappadocia. Is that right? Am I right? Yeah, we have a project on the construction in London and um, it's a good time to do some site visits. We just bought foundations. So it's always a good moment to see whether the levels are right and are they doing a good job. Um, so we spend the whole day essentially doing side visits, having meetings with engineers and uh, yeah, excited to also see that. Um, and always good when you fly to stop over and do whatever you need to do. But being back in Istanbul is amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm sure uh, all of our audience know you and you don't need any introduction, but in short, uh, would you like to introduce yourself as like, uh, who is Winka and what are you focused on these days? And what, uh, what is your practice focused on? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm originally from Holland, um, so I'm Dutch. Uh, came to the US in 1990 to study at Columbia University. Worked for uh, Bernard Schumi, Stephen Hall, and um, Peter Eisman. But I had to think for about where I worked. It's a long time ago. Um, but yeah, shortly after, in 94, I started my own office, uh, started teaching in Columbia. Uh, and after that, also at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, did that for eight years. So one semester Penn, one semester Columbia. And um, the office has always been this mix of academics, research, and design. And uh, to fast forward, uh, I became chair at Penn in 2013 and um, realized that uh, although we were already 20 years in the digital design realm, uh, the people were still saying the word new when they mentioned it. And so one of the first things I did as chair was to have a conference on the new normal that uh, we used to kind of investigate um, if you state that digital is now the normal, um, where do we innovate from there? What is this new platform? What are the new offices as we see them happening? Uh, there were a lot of hybrid offices, robotics and design, design and research um, and all kinds of other versions. Um, so it was a super interesting conference because I think it might have been the first one that stated that digital design was there to stay and was not going to uh, disappear ever again. Mm -hmm. uh, but also to see if it is there, what is then, um, what are the areas we can still uh, investigate in and where should we innovate? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So, so around nineties, like uh, this hype about digital was emerging, and most mm -hmm. companies, offices, architects were so excited about the new paradigm. Let's say yeah. new paradigm, uh, paradigm shift. Let's say, and architectonics just emerged for out of like these paradigm shifts and become a, became a practice. How do you think this uh, paradigm shift that we were expecting in that moment about mm -hmm. digital uh, to solve the challenges of architectural process have emerged in the last 20 years? And were we expecting this in, in that era? And on what a stage we are successful of mm -hmm. Uh, using digital tools? Uh, it's a super interesting question because um, I actually graduated in 1990 in Holland already with um, computer drawings. I think it was the first one, maybe. Uh, and, you know, you could say the digital was there in the 90s, but it was very much based on two-dimensional CAD drawings. It wasn't really CAD called them, so in fact, to works or ArchiCAD in Europe, I think. Um, and we were working on that as well, but I, I wasn't that interested in that. So for the longest time, I would design in 3D software, but then cut sections and draw the construction drawings by hand, which was the complete opposite of most offices where people would draw sketches by hand and then make two-dimensional CAD drawings. The but that was a shift. That, that was a shift. Total shift yeah. the, 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 your, your approach was a total shift. Yeah. 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 And it was definitely a very, very small group of people doing that. It was hard to find 3D software at that point. When I worked for Eisenman, I was sent on a workshop to Ohio to the inventor of Form Z, which is so ancient now if I think about it. But it was super exciting that we were three uh, design architects of Eisenman's office were sent there. And, you know, it's funny to think about this now, but that was like a real thing. And um, I remember the one of the first projects in the office was um, a folded glass building we did in uh, Soho in Manhattan. And uh, the real benefit I realized was that we actually never sent two-dimensional drawings to um, the people that made the folded glass and the mullions, um, because you know everything was in angles. Um, but we sent 3D drawings with XYZ coordinates. And you could say that that in 90, that was 98, I think, was probably the first parametric uh, design that we didn't call parametric because the term didn't exist, exist yet. But it was really coordination through 3D dimensional drawings that essentially made it possible to create a very complex manufactured artifact, our facade, to absolute perfection. So although things came from China, Spain, and were put together in Brooklyn, um, it was amazing that, that when it arrived in Soho, it all fit. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in the office, you almost work on all the scales, like from even product design into installations and also with, with the recent projects on much more larger scale of master plans and, and on city scale. How do you think this is kind of, uh, how do you keep the balance mm. of the same kind of design typology or the same kind of design language and different scales well I, I, every every project has its own challenges yeah. that's totally understandable but every architect is also have a design process has a kind of uh, a, a methodology in in solving problems and how, how does this work for you yeah, it's, it's interesting because we had, I, had, I gave a talk uh, at SciArc the other day and Tom Main asked exactly that question. Really? <laughs> and uh, that's why I was smiling when you said it. Uh, we actually use the smaller ones to innovate aspects we want to research, oh. which then we put into the bigger ones. So, for example, we did... A, Is it kind of prototyping or...? Well, the prototyping we do on both scales. But it really is testing out manufacturing of 3D curved surfaces or 
um, how to cloud things in ways that optimize uh, the way you use shapes in order to not make it extravagantly expensive. You know, we we are also an office that we don't really think that good design should be expensive. So we do a huge effort to optimize the amount of different curvatures or, or components in order to figure out ways to make things smarter, not just more beautiful, which we also like. Um, so, um, for example, when we did the Inkscape uh, meditation pods, which were gigantic 45-seater uh, rooms, um, we innovated a lot in that aspect, not only how to get the climate perfect and the sound perfect and uh, distribute everything evenly, which was actually kind of funny because these look super simple, but are one of the most highly engineered things we've made, which is interesting because you see nothing. Um, but we used that research a lot when we started working on a 35,000 square meter um, hybrid building for sports and concerts in China. And, and it was interesting because for us that is actually, the complexity in a weird way is not that different when you go up in scale. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the benefit of a bigger project is that you just have more money for the research. Uh, but the smaller ones, it's easier to do the research. So. We use a lot of the smaller projects really to advance the bigger ones in, in research and knowledge and material use and material ecologies and to see how we can uh, make things, um, optimize them. And we always work at the atypical, we're very non-standard office in many ways, but one of them is that we often work with manufacturers before we work with contractors. Contractors, yeah. And so somehow this small scale is feeding the large scale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, you mentioned the, about the project in China, the Asian uh, uh, Games. Uh, it's a huge master plan, which includes landscape architects, engineers, and also different types of stadiums. Um, and one of them includes a roof of a shell of doubly curved uh, surface. The other one is a, a stadium, table tennis stadium, mm -hmm. glass facade. Can you talk a little bit about these products and the kind of innovations yeah. and the innovative ideas that you brought to, to these stadiums or the entire project, actually? Yeah. You know, I think we, we as an office made a big shift in that uh, competition because it was an invited competition for five offices. A huge challenge to try and win that. And there were international, gigantic offices. So we were like, hmm, we kind of have to be fast and furious here. So uh, I proposed to my business partner to um, make equal partners with the landscape architect, uh, Melk. Uh, they're also Dutch, but in our same building in New York, uh, and Toronto and Tomasetti engineers. And what that was, the, the idea was really to make a team that was one team uh, and to also get their input earlier and to make them more equal and equally important. And so for us, that was, that was a huge step, uh, well, from financially, but also just um, because the, the way you work is very differently. Rather than you making a design and when it's done, giving it to the engineers, from the beginning, we had that really clever, smart engineering input. Um, and because we're all working on 3D software, it went really fast. And it was the same with the landscape architects. So very important, I think, was actually something we discovered in the process. The digital design has really erased the boundaries between engineers, consultants, and architects, and that you can work Absolutely. simultaneously. Yeah, yeah that, that, that gap is almost closed these days yeah. between engineers and architects. Well, not always, but yeah. <laughs> not always, in, but in yeah. The, in the right scenario, it is. Yeah, absolutely. And so we were able to um, develop, um, I said to George and Tomasetti, with the table tennis stadium that is a hybrid uh, to be a concert hall later. Um, I wanted the roof that basically was self-supporting, sitting on the inner bowl and cantilevering out over the outer bowl and carrying the facade. A reason being, I didn't want columns in the building. In order to have that flexibility to go from um, stadium to concert hall, we needed to make a design that was in seating already hybrid, but also in movement through the building. We wanted already like 
areas for drinks and um, whatever uh, later for the coffee for the concert hall um, so they developed something called the suspendum which is beautiful it's very deep in the middle and then becomes very thin to the edges um, and then the facade as it had no columns I made a steel double curved diagrid um, that again, I didn't want double curved glass on because one, I wanted the facades to be really textured. The other part of the building has uh, brass shingles that also have an overlap and have uh, sort of a 3D feeling. But all these glass fixtures are unique panels, is that right? They are, but because we, in parametric design, uh, figured out, uh, it's a Rhino plugin, as you know, yes. um, you can figure out uh, to minimize that. Yeah. So actually, they are the the glass the the glass surfaces are the same. What is actually differing because we made planar glass and we negotiated back to the double curved uh, diagrid with I call them eyelids. They're aluminum triangulated fins that uh, negotiate from the glass to the to the curves, and those differ. But that's very easy to make. So it was kind of a fun play between. Yeah. How do you, and, and the, it, the building is so large that uh, it sounds like, oh, you go from planar to curved and this is a massive deal. It's actually not. Actually, if you see the building, you just see a slight texture in the glass, but you have to really zoom in to see the eyelids. And it's quite funny because it's much more subtle than even I thought when I was designing that. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Uh, as you moved uh, from, as like we discussed about uh, larger scale, about the city planning, about uh, what do you think is the impact of architect in the city planning yeah. or let's say uh, in the city scale? Because it seems out to be, there are so multidisciplinary things going on around in the city. And architects is just one part of that whole ecosystem that forms the city. It, it seems that architect has a huge role in this, but at the end, it seems like architect has very less power on, on, the, on the formation of the uh, city policies or the uh, expansion of city. Like it's out of control, getting out of control of the architects. Like how do you think is the role of architect in the city these days or in the future cities might be better. Yeah, well, uh, I have a, a sort of double agenda as a chair at the uh, University of Pennsylvania when I run the department. It's um, really to bring research back to architecture. And when we did the, oh yeah, so I forgot to tell you, the master plan is 47 hectares or 116 acres. It's massive. It's 1.6 kilometers long. Asia, right. Yeah, the Asia project. And um, fun fact is that the government wanted it to be 85% park, but wanted seven buildings, <laughs> which is funny. So um, what it really is great right now, if you look at the park that is designed to be an eco park, so for the city, a green lawn, uh, it absorbs stormwater, it filters the water. We have rebuilt the, let, the wetlands that were completely gone. Um, so a lot of the role for this park for the city is apart from recreation and uh, kindergartens and sports fields is really to uh, be a green lung and, and filter climate and, and temper environmental impacts um, and make it better if possible. It absorbs, because it is, has mostly green roofs, because all these buildings have to be underground, uh, it absorbs, I think, something like 150 kilograms of carbon a year and produces about 120 kilograms of carb um, oxygen a year. So it makes a massive difference in, in this it environment. Yeah. Way. And then the building, so what you see is the two stadiums. The one was the hybrid one we discussed. The other one is a field hockey stadium. It's kind of a topological feature in the park. It's set in the landscape. And we had something called a zero earth policy or strategy, which means that if we excavate for the wetlands and uh, there is a valley, a shopping valley that connects under the road and under the river, the two halves of the park, 
uh, we put that earth back on these buildings that had to be unseen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have 20 meter hills in the site, uh, which is great because the buildings are really tucked in. The sound gets absorbed by these hills. So it's very quiet inside. And um, what you said about architects having agency. So the funny thing, as, a, as an architect, you have agency when you do research. So the research with a zero earth strategy, sponge city, stormwater control, you have impact on climate, environment. Um, we made a multiple access roads into the park. So the, the, the park is really accessible from the neighborhood. So that way you have agency. We added a lot of functions for the for the people that are currently camping in the in the park, which already upset one of my people in the office who was like, they're actually camping on my stage. There's an outdoor auditorium that they were camping on the stage. Um, but it's great because the idea was really that these buildings become attractors and generators of new possibilities for the city. And according to the committee, we won because we actually made that underground valley that really dips under the road and the river where we had to make an aqueduct for uh, the river, which is very Dutch. Um, but also when we you came... You had to have some Dutch touch. I had to have a Dutch <laughs> touch. And it was funny, the first meeting when we met them, they're like, yeah, we have discovered a huge problem. Under the road, there is a um, three or five meter, I forget, but diameter main drain for the city. And it's in the way of the valley. And so we were like, oh, no problem. And we're drawing a very deep dip. <laughs> and we're going to solve this. We're going to solve this. And uh, we were like trying to make it look pretty that it was this gigantic yeah. thing. And then the next time we came to site, um, they were like, listen, we have good news, bad news. You know, when we go on first, I was like, tell me the good news. And like, we got rid of the pipe. I was like, oh my yeah. God, it's amazing. It's the bad. <laughs> Yeah, the bat was actually irrelevant. We solved that, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> cool. yeah, but it was a fun. Uh, but yeah, so as an architect, in that sense, if you do enough research and you really know how to innovate, reduce costs, uh, make your designs how you want them to be, this level complexity, whatever, but also really understand that then you have to do the research and the investigations and the inventions sometimes sure. to make it affordable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, 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 one more thing about the city and the, uh, the impact that a building has, has, has inside, into a city, not in terms of environmental impact, but also socially, economically, also uh, about the space, the feelings that it, it could give to, to the uh, residents or to the users, to the visitors. On what stage do you think? Because the one small building is in this entire ecosystem of a city is just a small part. And what in, at, well, on what stage do you think uh, a building is impacting a, a, a large city or even a city and city is impacting the building? Because sometimes you see an iconic building standing there just absorbing so much attention uh, People want to just go there and sit around the city, around the building, even if they want to, they, they're not allowed sometimes to go in. I have a huge comment on that. Uh, most of these uh, super architectural, beautiful buildings you see all over the world, you're not allowed to go in. Like I was in, I was in Milan, the city life building of Zaha Hadid. I went to, uh, to visit. I had my press card, but I, I was not able to get in. I just went to the shopping area. I was in uh, in, in India, uh, for in Mumbai. I wanted to visit Nehru Center, which is a very good building. They just allowed me to visit the first floor, not the entire building. So this is a huge problem as well. Other than that, uh, on what scale do you think a building is impacting the city? A city is also impacting the yeah. Yeah, it, that, I really love what you're saying because it's so true. We, we are working on a tower in Rotterdam. And one of the first things we did is we kind of fractured the, or tapered the tower to not throw too much light on the environment. It's a 200 meter tower. Uh, but we also made crystalline um, sky lobbies that 
function as green lungs for the tower, but also function as kind of this pulling the city up into uh, the sky. So one is a small library, one is a gym, one is um, kind of um, like this meeting rooms that the building uh, rents and other people can use. Um, and the, it kind of connects to the lower lobby that is of course the entrance lobby. And my thought was exactly that is how can you make these buildings urban? How can you make part of the city um, and have give them also another function. That, that tower is really interesting because it's one of the first buildings that uses something that's very old principle, but it's a solar chimney, which means you pull the cold air from the in the night up and then by day it pushes the hot air out. And um, that that is connected to these lobbies. So these lobbies also have a lot of green plants to do the same as plants do. Uh, but it's interesting that um, that that's kind of completely under investigated. I don't know, the, you know, the, the aspect of a building having identity, I think is important, but not always only by making this, these gigantic iconic monuments. Uh, our first little building, what I realized is all the technological innovations of the folded glass, which then led to passive solar energy, um, the folding is really fun for the people in the building because um, you actually have rain on your facade, you see the sky, which is in city in the city hardly ever the case. Um, it's also what I live there and what was new to me, I'd never seen before, is that the first of all, the people who moved in were amazing. They were all completely creative. Cindy Sherman lives there. She was dating David Byrne, so I had a star starstruck moment in the elevator. But oh, this is the building that with the wooden uh, panels? And, and no, it's all folded glass. It's across from the street from the one yeah, you're yeah. thinking of. Okay, yeah, okay. it's all folded glass. And um, what I realized, our inhabitants were talking about the building as having identity. It was their building. So if they would go, where do you live? Oh, I live in this building that has this facade and everyone makes that movement. And it's so I realized if you do these technological innovations, one, you do them because you want a more interesting, more beautiful building. Two, you want them to work better climate wise, energy efficiency wise. They also become characters yeah. and it has something beautiful, but it doesn't have to be a massive icon. It can just be a building that, like this one, sits perfectly normally in a block, but has this tiny aspect that uh, what we call in the office a 15% deviation. I like to make buildings that are 85% standard and have only 15% deviation um, for the reason that I want. I do want to make affordable buildings where everyone can live. I'm not interested in high society buildings. <laughs> I like to make buildings that are affordable and good. Yeah, you should move towards 3D printing concretes. <laughs> well, we're looking at that already, yeah. Yeah, I'm so much into this uh, 3D printing concrete housing projects. Uh, I also w love uh, the affordable housing projects, but in a sense that it could be making a good architecture as well, not just, yeah. you know, so many projects out there without well, don't, don't get me wrong, that folded glass building is super expensive, sadly. Yeah. yeah. That's just the because of just the market in New York. Talking, <laughs> talking about, yes, this uh, glass goes, folds back, yeah. goes up. Yeah, I, I know. In New York, normally everything is, you know, <laughs> expensive. You can build it affordable, but then the market um, drives yes, the yeah. price. Yeah. So you're practicing uh, on many projects. You have your own office in New York. And also you're uh, in the academia. You're at UPenn uh, being a dean and uh, an educational part. How do you m make your time or balance between the academia and uh, practice? And which one you are mostly focused on? Well, it's interesting, you know, I. It sounds impossible, but I think I do more or less everything at the same time, all the time. Um, and I found that it's the best way. So I'm always reachable. 
Um, it sounds a little obsessive when, you, when I say it like that, but first of all, I'm not a micromanager, which helps. You know, I give people, I train them, I give them responsibilities. My teams are amazing. Um, so I trust the process and I, I'm a very long-term thinker. So when I started at Penn, I, uh, made, I thought it's really important that we share our knowledge, be open source. So we make a huge book every year. We have a huge conference every year. We have a lot of lectures and we share knowledge. We talk to our peers. And I think that's very important that knowledge is shared. And I, I didn't feel that we at Penn were doing a great job of that. Um, that really had a lot of other effects that I was hoping for that worked is one, we grew. Um, and why it's important to grow is not because we wanted more students, but if you get a high quality group of students in and you have more of them, you can also hire better and more professors. So I over, I more than doubled at this point the standing faculty. Um, I balanced it gender and race wise, which I thought was overdue. Um, so we have now actually more women on the faculty, yeah. on, this, on the standing faculty than uh, men. But also to put women in top positions, not just, oh, let's hire a token um, race specific or gender specific person, but really get the best people that are then also the people who are balancing that. Because ultimately it's a better education. It's for our students better that are also balanced and also very all over, um, especially race. We have almost every possible race, every possible country, I think 42 countries uh, in just one year of admission. So, but yeah, the, the sharing of knowledge and the, the growing of the department really helped us. But then apart from that, I really focused on how can we uh, give architects more agency? How can we change the role of the architect into something that is what it should be, I think? And for some reason, architects have, I think, helped themselves in the wrong way by, the, by focusing only on design. And I think design is our area where we have agency. But by adding research and innovation, you can have way more agency in leading big teams in advancing what uh, systems are developed to build our buildings. I have never been able to build a building without developing a new system because our systems are so outdated. They're ugly, over-dimensioned. They are not very exactly. smart. Exactly, this is the case. It's like... Like we were talking also in the car that uh, education is not just about the design and also it should contain just the research project, yeah. which is now you're you're, you're trying to bring yeah. in the uh, uh, in the programs that you're you're leading in them. But it's also because you know I drive a Tesla, and my Tesla is working on, as you know, the sun. Um, but also, it's amazingly designed. Technologically, it's super advanced. I can push a button and my windows come down. Now we think, why is she mentioning that? That's super normal. Well, have you found the building where you can push a button and the window goes down? Right? In my office, we have to hang with four people from an <laughs> aluminum window that doesn't want to go down. It's, it's unreal how far behind we are in the construction industry. It's very slow. Like, even very conservative industry that doesn't accept technology as so much faster. And now, in terms of design, we're a little bit ahead. But in terms of construction, we're so, so behind. Yeah. And... Uh, what, what, what do you think about these new AI tools that are emerging? And again, I'm using the term new uh, because it's actually quite new. Uh, it's not been even uh, four or five months, maybe four months, not five months. Like, uh, I don't know if you have heard of the Mid Journey, uh, DALI, that they're creating amazing design. And these designers are using these prompts generate designs. Do you, what do you think about it? Well, we work a lot on, on agent-driven designs at Penn also. Um, I think that is very interesting. I'm more interested in that than the metaverse. Let's put it that way. Yes. Yes. 
Indeed. AI, I think, is really interesting. And it's like digital design. You know, in the beginning of digital design, everything was swoopy and, and, and uncontrolled and weird and whatever. But you have to go through this phase to learn the tools, to understand what it is. And I think it's the same with designs driven by AI that we need to go through these morphing weird transitions, which are super interesting also. But like, I think we'll get to a point eventually where this will become also intelligent and smart and still uh, driven by that. I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, technology. We use it a lot at Penn. Um, and actually we have Acadia, our conference is coming up in October. And we have several workshops in that direction, um, both in robotics. Uh, as you know, we have one of the biggest robotics lab at this point in an architecture school. Uh, this is after you came, uh, this happened after you, you, you've been selected as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it like after three years, I was like, okay, this is time for, I remember there was actually quite a bit of resistance because everyone was like robotics and architecture. Why, Why we should do the robots? <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just I'm proposing yeah. the question by yeah, asking by people. Yeah. That was my answer to them because everything is made by robots. And if we don't learn how to design for that, we're already behind. And, you know, one thing is I do believe we have to prepare our students for 25 years ahead, not for next year. Right? Because, I mean, otherwise, what are we doing? It's an expensive study. So, um, but I think that's been really fun. So we have a gigantic robotics lab. I'm the director of it. We have several research labs in it. So in Acadia, we have a ton of robotics workshops, AI workshops. We are working on VR a little bit. VR, I find, is very behind. It seems to be that virtual reality environments have not developed. It's, it's kind of st stunning to me. They still look the same as they did, whatever, 15 years ago. <laughs> And that's also a thing to start thinking of, you know, how do we develop these worlds and what is it? And shouldn't be more architects involved because it seems that we're very stuck on a gaming um, environment that is always kind of out of control looking. Right, right. And you, you published recently a book mm -hmm. called Stranger Objects. I don't have a copy here, unfortunately. <laughs> that's why. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about the book and what, what, what are you actually uh, talking about? Mm -hmm. What does it encompass? Yeah, so, so this was interesting. We had three monographs and we're talking to um, the editor of Akhtar came for a um, studio visit in the office. And so I explained him the latest projects and, and somewhere he started smiling and I was like, what are you thinking? And he said, well, what I'm thinking is you don't need another monograph. You have three. I said, well, you know, <laughs> I would like to do a book with you. And he's like, yeah, exactly. And uh, me too. But I think you should do a book on the non-standard way you're working, which is super interesting. And I have actually hardly ever heard this before because you're more like almost an industrial designer before you become the architect and then you become the architect. And um, so we, I actually love that idea because it gave me a chance to talk to all the manufacturers I've worked with over the years. And by the way, the book is called Strange Objects, New Solids, Solids and Massive Things. Okay. And new solids being goes back to 3D design, right? Where we never think of things that are without the other dimension. It's always like almost like the fourth dimension, let's say. Um, as in mathematics, fourth dimension, the hypercube. Um, massive objects? And massive objects is really because we're interested in objects, but we like them to be sort of like opaque. Mm -hmm. um, not because they have to be opaque, but just because I think there are too many glassy towers. <laughs> <laughs> so just how do you turn that around? What do you, yeah. what do you focus on is kind of the title. I, I have thought about just calling it strange objects, but uh, we had a fam fantastic uh, graphic designer called WSDIA, uh, which means we should do it all. Uh, and they were really like, no, 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 it has to have those three um, terms in there. So we did that. And um, as we are very, and the book is also norm standard because there is no text by someone else saying why this book is important. 
we and just, no 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 comments are no, there no. No. because we didn't need that at we thought but there is a text by the graphic designers okay. why the book is a strange object and there is a great text by Manuel de Landa on the subject of you know non standard and uh, research and innovation and what that means for architecture. So there are several other texts, and of course we all wrote the office. We wrote a lot of texts, but yeah. So it's a, it's non-standard. The book itself it's made to, to look like a, a car manual of the 50s and 30s. Um, the graphic designer was really inspired by those old or tractor. I mean, it's more yeah. like tractor manuals uh because he was like listen you're talking about these components and how they go together and you know how do they go together so the book is two pieces of cardboard and there is holes in it so you can put it in a ring binder <laughs> it's quite funny cool. yeah you will get one i yeah. promise yeah thank you thank you so much and yeah uh it's amazing uh conversation with you and uh, do you think, would you like to share anything with young designers and uh, professionals out there? Yeah, I think, you know, the one thing I realized over the years, keep work, putting your work out there because by, by doing that, by putting your work out there, you get better clients that are interested in what you do rather than just working in architecture to make money. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately we all hope or the reason why we study so long as we do, uh, is that we all hope that our work is a reflection of what we believe in and what we like to put out in the world rather than the endless buildings that maybe are buildings, but not necessarily architecture. So I think just keep putting your work out there and clients will find you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. One last question. What do you think about our platform? <laughs> uh, I admire parametric architecture in the way it grew, in the way you do actually put these young designers forward. It really helps them. Um, I love looking at it. I find people to teach at Penn in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very inspirational. So thank you for doing that. Thank it's you. a great thing to have as a reference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I will look forward for your uh lecture at CDMX conference in two days and thanks for this amazing conversation thank you thank you so much goodbye okay